what Islamic concept of God, Islamic concept of the purpose of our creation, Islamic concept of the, the what happens after we die, the accountability. What, what, what are your understanding about this so far? Does that resonate with you? Do you feel that yes, I can I can understand and accept that? I feel like I, I can understand and accept it. It's still something that I'm, I'm not fully, you know. Yeah. So so do you you personally as a because you said you have a Catholic background, right? So you already believe in God. Okay. What's your understanding now, having read the Quran and seeing that I mean, in the Quran you haven't? No, not enough. Not I, I, as long as you understood that we believe that God is one and only and doesn't have a daughter or a brother or a son or a sister or a mother or a father. God is one and only and unique. There is no likeness unto God. Compared to what the Catholics believe, which one now to you, to your heart and mind, is more appealing and makes sense? Uh, so I know in the Quran there's a passive a section. It's a literary, a literary miracle. It has so many literary devices, yeah. and no uh, scholar can replicate something like this. So something like this convinces me more that it would be Islam. Yeah. So that's the evidence for the Quran being from God, yeah. right? Yeah. From the inimitability of its chapters or the whole book of it. But the Quran describes God as being one and only without having a lineage upwards or downwards. Okay? He is not born and he doesn't give any offspring or birth. Does that concept make sense to you? Yeah. yeah. So as you know this is in, is in stark contrast to the Christian concept of God where there's God the Son element to it. Okay. So so this is in fact a very much a huge step to closer in accepting Islam already because in your heart you've already taken the first part of the Islamic declaration there is no God worthy of worship except one and only God who is one God Allah the second part of being part of this commitment of knowing and acknowledging there is a creator is by following your life with the dictates and directions by this creator and the only way we do this is by submitting to his will so you surrender to the will of God you can only do that by knowing what the will of God is you and I cannot do that by ourselves because we don't know what the will of God is God doesn't speak to you personally like every day on the telephone or something so God sends a prophet or a messenger and being the final of them is Prophet Muhammad so he is the final messenger through which the will of God is known so he expresses the will of God so that we can submit to God by knowing that will so he is now the one to accept as a prophet or a messenger from God who brings us this message to follow so once you accept that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger and prophet of God then you have now come fully to the fold of Islam you are actually a Muslim now not only Muslim by your body because your heart is a Muslim already your lungs is a Muslim already everything follows the God's law the inbuilt that God has put forward but with your own soul with your own will with your own volition you would come into the fold of Islam so does it resonate with you that yeah Prophet Muhammad is a messenger of God uh, I think I need to read more hadiths. Right. More. So it's not just reading more hadith, it's knowing who he is, what he said, what he did, and does that make sense to us? How do we know he is indeed a prophet of God or is he an imposter or a fake individual? We have to differentiate that. Okay? So first part is over, meaning we have already come to the stage where yes, there is nothing worthy of worship except the one and only true God. And that God is the one who is most perfect, independent and absolute and self sufficient. He cannot be like someone who says, oh, I cannot do myself anything of myself, right? He has to be independent. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa let's go through some of the things that we can establish by positive evidence and falsification tests, right? If someone is a prophet of God, you would expect evidence to support this claim. Yeah? Things the prophet has said or did or why is that doing these things? The motives, for example. 
So let's start with the negative aspect, okay? Is it possible that he could have been a fake prophet, an imposter, pretending to be a prophet of God and trying to, for his own motivational gain, claim to be a prophet? Okay. But as you know, for every claim people make about something, that I am X, Y, and Z, there's a motive behind it. They don't just do willy-nilly, okay? Unless they're crazy. So either the prophet was a crazy individual, didn't know what he was saying, what he was doing, totally deluded, or he was quite conscious of what he was doing, he's fake, imposter, or he is indeed a true prophet of God. So we can break down to the three main categories. Insane person, he could say anything, oh I am the king of England. He might, so a man might say, I am the queen of England, right? He's insane, they don't even know what they're talking about. So let's deal with this first part about the insanity. An insane person will reflect about their insanity in their statements and in their actions. Okay? You would not find them, an insane person, giving you, oh, this is the way to solve the equations of thermodynamics or something like that. Oh, this is the current economic crisis and I'm, I'm, let me tell you, um, this is worth it. Because that's a job or, or action of someone who is self-aware, conscious, in, in the right mind, in the right senses. Not someone who's insane. If we find the statements, what the Prophet brought, either his own, which is collected in the Hadith, or the Quran, primarily, which he received as a revelation. If we find that that goes against someone being insane, then we can disregard and discount this position that he was an insane person. So when the Quran talks about, have the unbelievers not known? أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ كَانَتَا رَتْقًا فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيٍّ أَفَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ This is the Quran. The rough translation or interpretation is the creator God, the author of this Quran. Because we are now questioning, could it be Prophet Muhammad himself, alayhi salatu salam. This book is saying, have the unbelievers not known or seen that the earth and anything beyond this earth is called sky, sky, samawat, saman samawat. All of these celestial things are up there above the earth, the skies, the heavens and everything, heaven not paradise, heaven doesn't disguise, that everything was joined together. Have they not known that they was joined together as one piece? And God parted it asunder. And then he brought every living thing from water. Would they then not believe? Now, look how it starts. It's not addressing just any people here and there. It's addressing the unbelievers, those who are not believing in God or believing in Islam and so on, right? And it ends by saying, would they then not believe? And in between, you expect then, since like a reasonable approach, addressing someone's concern and then saying, are you not, are you not going to believe now? So what's been provided in between seems like some kind of evidence, but we can actually see what it is. It's actually quite striking. Two pieces of information, one from astrophysics and one from biology. So the information of astrophysics is the common origin of our world. The Earth and all the stars and galaxies, the Quran is saying everything was actually at one piece, one point. And there was separation. That's not coming from an insane person because in, this individual is saying, have you not known about it? Have you not seen it? Have you not come to know this is the reality? And then asking you, would you not believe? This doesn't reflect a person who's insane just making himself. But that's one point. As if it wasn't sufficient, the next part of it is from biology. Every living thing is from water. Now my focus on now is every living thing. Someone can say, okay, he said just living things from water because there may be common sense here and there, but every living thing? Did people know every living thing at that time? They didn't have microscopes. They could not have seen a bacteria. They could not have gone deep down the very deepest ocean and found the living things also requiring water as a source of their life. What about deep down in a dead vol volcano? So deep down, no man has even gone through. We know now organisms, the living things, maybe microscopic, 
they still need water. So, to make a statement that every living thing is made from water is a profound statement. It can only be said by someone who knows every living thing, or someone just being very bold. But he cannot be an insane person, because he could have been proven just wrong by that time, or even later now, or even today. So, this doesn't reflect in a statement like that, which makes us to ponder on the universe, our natural universe, not natural environment, the cosmos, and ask us to reflect and then take this as an evidence for its claim. So when the Quran talks about how God created the human beings in the wombs of the mothers, stages after stages, creation after creation, going from one form to the other, that's not someone how an insane person will say, because whatever they say, may be proven to be wrong even by the scholars of science and technology or physicians or at that time but we know at that time people had some ideas they got it wrong later as they developed microscope in 1673 van leeuwenhoek even then they got it wrong now we know how human beings don't just a full adult just become bigger and bigger and bigger in the womb it's not the case it's a whole transformation process that's what the quran is saying so how can we then say this is a statement of an insane, crazy individual? It doesn't reflect. It's a profound statement of someone who is well aware of the scientific reality of our world. So, I think there's two examples of this enough to say, in terms of his behavior and actions, he was very conscious, very aware, compassionate, merciful, forgiving. He was the ruler, the judge, he was the one who organized the society, changed the society. It's not an insane person what you expect them to do. So insanity is not a motive or, 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 or a, a typical characterization of the prophet. It cannot be an insane. Okay. The second category we said, could he be then an imposter, a fake prophet, pretending to be a prophet for some gain, some benefits, right? So what are the motives people usually come up with claims like that? Some kind of material gain? Some kind of gain to do with wealth, status, uh, honor, fame, glory, uh, having the riches and women and all that thing, right? So let's look at what happened in reality. At one point he was talking about the prophet by saying, uh, why are you calling us to worship God? You know what? Stop calling that. You are disrupting our economy. Because people used to come from all around the world, from Syria, from Yemen, to do all this pilgrimage in Mecca to their pagan idols. There were many, many idols. In fact, it's like every single angle at 360 idols all placed around the Kaaba. He says, no, there is only one creator, one God. These are not the creator. He says, stop that. By saying this, our society is being disrupted. We are losing our business and so on. You know, you are creating disunity between us. What do you want? They said, do you want to be the king? We will make you the king. Oh, do you want money? We will give you the money, the wealth. Oh, you want women? Just name them. Now is a golden opportunity. If someone is, their motive is to be the ruler, the king, there you go, has an opportunity. He can now become the make, king. With that compromise, he's okay, leave the idols alone. So he's done his job. The reason if a fake imposter was supposed to achieve his particular motive, he's achieved it now, they're offering him. So they offer him to be the ruler, the king, the wealthiest of the, of the people they will gather because all of these tribes will collectively uh, contribute together to make him rich as much as he wants. And the women, if he really wanted women, that's what he was because he was a womanizer, they could have given him. He rejected all of that. He says, look, at one point he said, if you gave me the sun in one hand and the moon in one hand, it's an impossible task to do. Even if you did that, I would not stop myself from calling to the worship of one God. So he did not accept this offer, which is so lucrative. If he was a fake individual, he should have got it. One point, there was an eclipse that happened. And that happened, it coincided with the death of his son. People were saying, look, even the sun or the moon is crying, eclipse is happening because of the death of the prophet. So, if he was a fake 
and an imposter, that was his golden opportunity to say, yeah, of course, I'm a prophet of God. That's why things are happening. He says, no. The sun and the moon, they do not happen like this. At least they don't happen because of someone's death or birth. Okay, I'm paraphrasing what I can remember of this statement. But these are the signs of God. So, you should worship God alone, not, not any of these things. Okay? So, another opportunity is just totally rejected. A fake individual would have taken that opportunity. Okay. What if somebody say maybe his motive was he wanted to reform the Arabian society? But look at what happened. His reform was such that he created division between parents and children, between wife and husband. Because people will be accepting Islam and not worshipping this thing. Destabilizing the society. The reformation is not working. In fact, or maybe he was trying to unite the Arabs together. What he said is, look, Maryam, she is one of the most chosen one of the ladies of the world, the women of the world. A Jewish individual. Why is he praising a Jewish woman that she is the best among the women of the world? If he was to unite the Arabs, they would not be united because of that. Just imagine the English, the EDL or EDJL, whatever they are, the Jewish English Defense League, right? They want, we want the England united. They only want to do it by praising Hitler. It's not going to work, is it? So it's not reformation that he's after. It's not unification the Arabs is after. What else could his motives be? We are left with, I mean, I want to just summarize it here. We are exhausted. All of the motives one can possibly have where they are trying to claim to be a prophet and do so. When he became a prophet and he ruled the Arabian Peninsula and he died, alayhi salatu salam, he passed away. You would expect someone who's a fake prophet would have accumulated so much material resources of this world, like we see in the kings and queens and of, of, of this world, the pharaohs, or even like the, go to the Buckingham Palace and see how the lavish lifestyle their people had and so on and so forth. The, you can actually see in the internet, in you know, YouTube, a, a 3D image of his household. So he was lying on a bed made of palm fibers a brick for his pillow there was a new utensil for water just few things like that a few dates here and there a few totals that's it his companions that ruled almost one third of the world after him immediately after him so they were once they conquered Jerusalem from the hands of the Crusaders, for example, or you can call them the Christians at the time. So he had to travel to all the way to Jerusalem. How did he go? To all his groups of people like what we see like the kings and pharaohs of the world did know. The Khalif and his one companion, which is his attendant. It was a horse or a camel, I can't remember. One of those mounts, right? What did he do? Did he just sit on the mountain, just go all the way from Mecca or Medina to all the way to Jerusalem? Day's journey? No. He said, that's not fair. My attendants, like a servant, right? We do in turns. So you, I'll carry the rope and walk, and you sit, and we'll switch and swap. So he came to Jerusalem at that point because it was a turn still for the attendant. Now every leader in the world would have watched it. Get off, get off, get off. Let me go on because I am the Caliph. I'm going to go to be greeted. To do that. No, it's your turn. You continue. So they came. Now they see someone on the mount and someone holding the rope of the camel or the horse, right? And they're trying to speak to him. He says, no, no, no. I am not the Caliph. It's him on the ground. This is how it made people because of the teaching of Islam, the fairness and justice. This is a just treatment demonstrating even the Khalif does not free himself from being just and fair. So the Prophet of Islam, the legacy he left behind, 
demonstrates that he is not also someone that at his time people knew that he was a fake prophet. They would die for him knowing that he's a truthful individual. So there is no motive that we can establish and pinpoint that he was a fake individual and an imposter. When we look at now what he brought, some people say, you know what, there's two other exam uh, categories they say. Maybe he had an epileptic fit because we read in the hadith like, you know, when he was receiving revelation, he could hear the ringing of the bells and sometimes his mouth would froth or something. Oh, that looks like an epileptic fit. Maybe that's why he got this revelation. But here's the problem. Epileptic fits, grand mal or generalized epilepsy and so on, does not produce a work like the Quran. If you were to investigate the Quran, a piece of work talking about astrophysics, biology, geomo, talking about history, past, future, prophecies, the world, the cosmos, economic system, crime system, the moral system, it doesn't reflect someone in their fit when they're unconscious coming up with all these things. Makes no sense. So it's, it's a very, really um, a foolish category to say, okay, because an epilepsy prophet became that. A critic, a good sane critic would not even bring this uh, uh, claim that, oh, he was an epileptic and that's why he got this Islam or uh, the Quran. There are others who say, okay, maybe it was Satan. Satan did it all together and he was confused and so on and it was all a conspiracy to remove from the worship of God and Satan has his play to take people away from the worship of God. Maybe that's why. But guess what? What does the Quran say? The Quran talks about we don't worship anyone. No one except the one who is worthy of worship which is God. Don't take Satan as your friend. Take him as your enemy because he will try to mislead you always. And when you read the Quran, seek refuge with God, the Creator, from the accursed Satan. So is Satan telling people to curse him before you read the book? It makes no sense that this would be a product of Satan. Even the Quran says, if human beings and the jinns, Satan being one of them, one of this kind jinn, if they were to come together collectively to make something like the Quran, they will be never be able to do so. So the Quran even challenges. It's not like Wama It is not possible even for Satan. This is not a product of Satan. Neither Satan is able to do so because what the Quran talks about, the information, whether it's science, whether it's history, whether it's prophecy, it's impossible for even Satan to produce something like it. Okay? So what are we left with then? It's not the man himself because he's limited by his time and place. He could not talk about what the Quran talks about. It's not something like an individual who's a fake or a crazy. The only thing that is left by elimination is he must be what he is, claiming to be a servant of God, a prophet of God, who has brought with proof and evidence the message of God to the people. He says, don't elevate me like people have done in the past. Don't elevate me. What happened to uh, Jesus Christ, the messenger? People elevated him. He says, no, don't elevate me like what the... Christians and other people have done in the past. But take him as a, a servant of God, as a prophet and a messenger. That's why no Muslims you will see on planet Earth worship the prophet. They will say he's a prophet of God and a servant of God. That's something that God has honored him with to say Abd. Subhanallah, Asra bi Abdihi. God has honored him even saying my servant, my slave. So we don't consider like this is like, oh, a servant of God is a very honorary position. God himself calls, he is my servant, meaning one who serves me and no one else. So we are left with elimination of all the other possibilities, bar one, which is he's a true prophet of God. When we now look at the positive evidences, this is eliminating this negative, right? Showing that he cannot be an imposter. Did he make statements? Did he say things? We've already alluded to some of them already in the things he said. So we now know from his statements alone that he brought the Quran. It is something that is inimitable. If it's a product of a human being, 
like this. You can imitate it if you know Arabic. You can do likewise. And guess what? The time when the Quran challenged them, they were the best at their time in poetry, in prose, in literary composition. They were the best. They would have competitions. And the best of the poems or the literary piece, they will hang it on the wall of the Kaaba. They call Mu'allaqat, the hanging ones, the suspended poems. The seven ones are famous ones, are published by even by an orientalist called A.J. Arbery, the seven odes. Even in English translation, you can see how beautiful they are when they're describing. Because they reach to a level of peak and eloquence in the language they were describing. When they were describing women, oh man, they, it's like the women will fall for them the way they're describing. When they're describing about sorrow and pain, you would be crying with them. When they're describing about bravery, you would say, let's go and fight. That's how they mastered the language and impact it had on the people by their vocabulary, by their constructions. When the Quran came and said, you know this prophet is illiterate. He is not known to you to have learned reading and writing, let alone going to school. And the Quran is giving it to you and you think someone else composed it to help you with it? Produce a chapter like unto it. You've known him all your life. So why do you say so? So if you really think he's just invented it, forged it, he may did something like it. Because you are the expert. But if you know that you cannot do it, then fear the fire of hell, whose fool is man and stoats. So the hellfire has fuel. It's not like you have di um, what are they called diesel and petrol. Stones and human beings will fuel the hellfire. People might think, how can stone fuel the hellfire? You know we can cook on stones? When you hit them, they become so heated, so hot. People can actually cook things on hot stones. Okay? So these will be so much heat coming out from there, they will be the fuel of hellfire. So God is saying, if you really are doubtful about what God has sent down to his servant, Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, then produce a chapter like thereof of the Quran. And if you cannot do it yourself, then seek the helpers and supporters besides God if you are truthful in your doubt but if you cannot do it and you'll be never be able to do it then fear the fire who's fuel those man and stones but if you believe and do righteous deeds then the gardens underneath which rivers flow God promises them the reward is awaiting so why is it that the Quran is something that people cannot imitate some people said ah you know what I can get chat GPT to imitate it so I tried it to chat GPT to help chat GPT the language model 3.5 at that point doesn't matter if it's 4.6 gave all the criteria objective criteria come up with what the Quran is saying more than one hour video if you type in chat GPT Quran imitation and Mansoor my name you get this video even chat GPT confirm it's not possible people were saying ask him the next question do you want to become a Muslim to chat GPT that's how to the point chat GPT a language model which is not conscious agreeing with objectivity then it cannot be imitated because objectively that's how the linguistic structure of the Quran is we're not only talking about eloquence and meaning and grammar and beauty of, of the language how the Arab excel and Quran excels degrees above that but the composition of it in terms of how it's composed is something that becomes objectively verifiable because eloquence is subjective so you need to know the composition structure to say this is the form I have 14 words and 14 lines you know sonnets of Shakespeare and something like that so this is how the Quran has its each chapter of the surah has its own unique style and the Quran is saying produce any chapter like unto it each chapter has its own style unique style no chapter has a style like the next chapter which people don't realize because they're so accustomed to reading it if you were to take to give an example stories of say how prophet Moses dealt with peace be upon him with the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh was chasing him and how they got drowned right this story is narrated across several chapters you could do an experiment and say that particular information from one chapter replace it on the information of the other chapter 
It's the same information. When you do so, when you recite it and read it, you will see a break of flow. It doesn't fo fo follow. Because the way it is constructed, the tone, the rhythm, the rhyme, is different. And that's one of the things, out of many, the Quran is never ever boring to anyone who listens to it. Every other book, how many times can you read a book? Harry Potter. Once, twice, hundred times, you're going to get up, fed up. You're going to get bored. Muslims read the Quran every day throughout the whole life. They never get bored. Every time the Quran rejuvenates, it's, it's, it's like it's bringing you new things. It's, it's way this is how it's designed by the Creator, so that you don't feel bored. Not only that, the Quran is produced, not produced, revealed by God and composed in such a way that's easier for it to remember. Even though it's, it's quite a large book, 114 chapters of various length. We have people almost in all our families that are all called Hafiz of the Quran, memorize of the Quran whole book. Almost most families, hundreds and thousands of people now have memorized the whole Quran from cover to cover. Happened yesterday, the month before, the year before, throughout the time until we go back to the Prophet Why is it so easy to remember a book like that without how? A non-Arab. I'm, I'm a non-Arab. I have a family member, I don't want to go into much detail, who's memorized the Quran. Not an Arab. You have many people who are not Arabs. They don't even know Arabic, what it means, what it says. They can read it because just like when we study physics, we know the Greek alphabet, right? This is lambda, this is beta, this is alpha, this is gamma, because we use that in our maths and physics. So we can learn about the symbols and those who want to learn more, they can actually even start reading sentences and so on. People do. That's how many Muslims around the world learn how to read the Quran without even knowing it. But they can memorize it without having no understanding of meaning. This is a miracle of the Quran, a book that you cannot even know what it says, you're still able to memorize the whole book. Try doing an experiment with not knowing Chinese, for example, and memorizing the whole book in Chinese. Yeah? So, what I'm asking, what was my friend again, your name? Dara. 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 Dara, Dara, Dara I'm Mansur. Dara. These are examples of positive points to reflect on, to assess, scrutinize, and verify that this book indeed is from God. And this man who claims to be prophet of God is indeed the prophet of God. There are various others, but there's no point giving you I hope, more and more and more. These should be enough for you to reflect and say, make sense, reasonable, something that's testable, and something that's verifiable. That's our approach. We don't say become a Muslim just for the sake of it, by blind faith. No. Know who you are worshipping. Quran says, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Know, know, have knowledge and certainty that there is no deity worthy of worship except one and only Allah. So this is a condition. To worship Allah or God is the condition of knowledge. Of course there are other conditions with truth, with sincerity and so on. But knowledge is paramount. You have to know who you worship. So the Quran wants you to become a Muslim, which is the reason why you're created here in this life, to fulfill your obligation that you're created for, to submit to God, submitting to His will. And if you do so, then in the hereafter, God has promised you paradise, heavens with eternal bliss and joy, happiness, tranquility, felicity and bliss. That's what there. He created us in this life to test us. Because human beings have been given one thing which not many other creations share. It's the gift of free will. With your free will, you can decide to listen to God and obey Him, or you can disobey Him, reject Him, become a stubborn and arrogant individual. With this faculty, you have to make yourself deserving, whether you deserve the mercy of God, or you deserve His wrath, His punishment through justice. Because God is not unjust to His creation. He is not going to punish anyone unjustly at all, to the least. He is not even to the least, He is a, an unjust individual, unjust creator. So that means every human being has been given 
this role to fulfill and the capacity those who are not capaci in, in their capacity they're incapacitated like someone who's totally insane they would not be punished because they are not in the in their in their makeup in which they can distinguish between right and wrong truth and falsehood so anyone who is an insane individual totally they cannot distinguish between truth and falsehood right and wrong they don't get punished in hellfire because that's unjust to do it's okay that's, that's unjust right god also says he doesn't burden burden anyone greater than they can bear that means he does not give us a task to do which we're unable to do that's why he sent a prophet and a messenger who was a human being like us if god sent angels on the earth and told us through the angels oh be good be nice be charitable fast and pray some people will say i can't do that i'm a human being i'm so weak you're an angel you can do it god removed that excuse by sending a human being like us raising a human being like us well. he can fast so can you he can pray so can you he can be charitable so can you yeah so this excuse is removed but he also says he does not punish a nation or a tribe or a group or a community until he sends them a warner telling them that they should reject all the false deities and worship god alone so the knowledge is given to them first before they're being accountable dust and fur so if a nation didn't have access to the message of islam you cannot say they're going to go to hell because there will be another mechanism Some, imagine now someone today never heard of islam at all so it's not that directly go to hell there are other things to come into play god said that he created people with this free will right the intellect the aql in arabic we are supposed to use the aql if we used our aql our intellect we would not worship a tree or a stone or an idol we would not true exercising application of the intellect will reject worshiping of your shoes of your glasses worshiping of a human being worshiping of thunder sun moon because none of this is independent self-sufficient almighty creator the lord of the heavens and the earth so your intellect will reject all of that so god reminds us there are people who are deserving to go to hellfire because of what they have believed and done as they're drugged in their chains in the hellfire the angels of the hellfire will ask them did they not come to you warn us telling you of this day they said yes warn us came forget them we belied them we denied them we rejected them and we said god doesn't reveal anything but then they will confess they would say had we listened to them those prophets and messengers and their ambassadors like muslims now how do we listen to them or use our aql لو كنا نسمع أو ناقل ما كنا في أصحاب الصعيد. If we had listened to them or used our intellect, our intelligence, our intellect, we would not have ended up in this disastrous place. So huge role of the intellect. So the people will, those who didn't have an opportunity to receive direct message, in the day of judgment they will be tested and they will be asked of the exercise of the intellect. So God will dispense his justice even to those who did not receive direct message from God okay this is the fairness of Islam this is justice of Islam so no one will in fact in fact even more greater is this even before we were born God took a covenant from us from all the children of Adam when we are in the state of souls only when God dragged all the souls from the Adam min zuhurihim from his back and he says alas to me rabbikum am i not your lord they said bala of course you are and and god will say in case you said oh we didn't know it was our forefathers who believed in it and we followed them and so on so in our deep inside in our soul it's imprinted that there is a creator there is a god it's imprinted that's why an atheist when they're about to fall from the sky 
because the engine stopped working. It's on fire. They said, oh God, help me. The cat comes out of the bag at that point. Because deep inside, the imprint is there. Now they're seeing the reality. They don't say, oh, teenage ninja turtle, mutant turtles, help me. Oh, Superman, help me. No one cries like that. But we have many stories we see in reality. They say, oh, whoever you are, God, help me. Atheism goes out of the window because they're afraid to die at that point. So what we say, the society, the immediate environment, which is the family, conditions an individual to make a misjudgment and cloud over this. So if you're born in a family, which is a polytheist, they will condition you to believe that God is a stone, God is a monkey, God is a whatever, and then it will cover this internal true disposition, which is believing and knowing that there's only one true creator, they'll cover it up by indoctrination. That's why Prophet of Islam Muhammad Sallallahu said, every child is born in fitrah, in this natural disposition, every child. It is the parents that make them a Jew or a Christian or a Magian or a fire worshiper and so on. Parental conditioning happens. As you go, school conditioning, college conditioning, societal conditioning, celebrity conditioning, politician conditioning. We are totally, to all the time we've been conditioned. Yeah? That's why people are conditioned by the matrix, as some people say, right? You watch so much science fi movie, you think there's a god of the underworld, you think god of the underworld, you think, yes, you can just become. They are doing all this conditioning. A lot of people, I, I was in Leicester Square yesterday, right? Doing this kind of discussions again with people. And if you look at the people, how they are in their worldview, they think this is it. The only thing in this life that's important is to be happy, is to, is to get laid. Wearing clothes in such a way that the man will see and say, okay, let's get laid with her. That's their life. It's amazing how people totally have gone away from reflecting on the very purpose of their existence. How long is eternity? in paradise or in hellfire compared to 120 years of this life. We forfeit the eternal happiness with the momentary happiness with drugs and rock and roll and women and this and that. And then end up in hellfire forever and forever. People, I thought people knew maths and common sense. And they don't wake up. Like, how are you really giving away your whole eternal life with this momentary happiness you say you know what it makes me happy but the real happiness this happiness in this life never lasts never lasts they're always momentary that's why we're always asking for more and more the dopamine effect right the serotonin and all these chemical components neurotransmitters more and more and more look at what's happened to the society people they have desensitized so much to the point that even if they see a naked woman, they don't get aroused anymore because they are desensitized. So what they need is to go to some shops and get whips and handcuffs and then really whip someone, all this kinky business, whatever they call, right? Um, and that gives them the pleasure. Or do things which are all perversion because the natural reaction, natural attraction between opposite sex this, they've totally destabilized it. Destabilized it. So that's where society is going. But Islam guarantees the society by making the norm as the norm. Where? So that's why you can ignore her. I mean, people are people. So Islam says no. Do not create imbalance. God has created this in Wala Tuxirul Mizan. Do not create imbalance. God says Corruption has occurred in the lands and the sea. What the hands of man have earned. We are polluting the air. We are polluting the land. We are polluting the sea. God is saying, no. Don't do that. Don't create this imbalance. Don't create a layer, hole in the ozone layer. Look after the environment. Very important.
important. So Islam is to make sure we live in this life, in this earth, in a way which is progressive, developing, harmonious, content, and we fulfill our life for which we are created for, in a way to remove ourselves from each other, from envy, from jealousy, from greed, from hatred, but to live by knowing that we are all the creation of God and should be the worshipper of God. But those who create imbalance, commit genocide, atrocity and oppression, you don't just leave them be. You need to do something about it. The eyes of the law will deal with them. The educational system of Islam will deal with people's conditioning and programming to behave like a genocidal maniac. Look how the world, the whole world, is a genocidal maniac. Seeing the Palestinians getting killed and they say, oh, mm, yeah, Israel is our friend. And Look at that. How people have really left their senses inside the, what makes a human, the humanity of it. It's gone. Islam says no. It will bring you back to humanity and the values of humanity. Those who say, oh, you're humanist. No, you're not. Islam will tell you what the real values are of love and compassion, of sympathy, of empathy, of helping each other, of courage, of patience, and removing all the evil vices I talked about, about jealousy and hatred and greed. Islam will totally transform you into a different human being. That is the message of Islam, which the very reason Prophet Muhammad Islam said one of his mission was the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said I have been raised to perfect the nobility of character we don't consider you are already doomed you're gonna to go to hell and the only way you can do that believe someone else died for you no irresponsible behavior Islam says no every human being is responsible for their own actions responsible for their own actions so be a man and be a woman and take that responsibility do not say oh, I can't do anything I can't uh, I'm not good enough no you are good but you can be better you can perfect that's why the Prophet was sent to perfect the nobility you know what's just you know what's right stealing someone your heart will tell you it's not right because that's why you try to oh, no one's looking um, and then you feel like oh someone's gonna watch and so you know it's not right your heart will tell you killing is wrong so those people who do oppression and injustice do they not know they do know are they gonna get away with it in this life maybe but not in the court of God's law in the day of judgment because every single individual good or bad they will be all resurrected and they will have to account for their belief and deeds there are scribes recording on our shoulders which we can't see we can understand now better compared to people 1000 years ago they would say how can someone record it look we are recording things on a mobile phone now speaking to someone thousand years thousand miles apart with my friend I'm speaking and seeing his picture live video yeah so this kind of recording is not unimaginable to contemplate and appreciate we have angels recording every single good things we do every single bad things we do so in the day of judgment your book will be given this is what you've done you will try to say no hide nothing will be hidden your hands your legs will speak your skin will speak because God will give them the ability to speak saying yes this individual he walked around there he found a woman in the alley and he raped her your legs will testify against you you found someone's wallet on this somewhere and you took it off for yourself even though you had the ID card he informed them oh I found your wallet every single penny or a cent you'll be accountable for and not just like penny for penny the hellfire the punishment is unimaginable the amount of punishment so God wants us he said even look are you going to say, oh, I'm going to be saved because um, I am from a noble family? Yeah. The kings and the queens, the richest of the richest, everyone.
everyone will be nobody. Because at that time, only Allah will be Malikul Mulk, the King of Kings, the judges of judge. He will dispense justice. And no one will have any injustice done to them. So no one's going to get away. The rapists, the genocidal maniacs, they're not going to get away. The oppressors, the killers, the murderers, they're not going to get away. Everyone will see everyone will see the good they have done and the bad they have done so this is what Islam says the purpose of your life is to be a good submitter to God and if you do so and die on that state God has promised you gardens under which rivers flow a place of tranquility contentment bliss what awaits there no eyes have seen no ears have heard you will eat things from there you have some resemblance but it would not be the same things as this food whatever you wish will be granted you will have no enmity you will have no greed you will have no je jealousy you will have no hatred which all of that will be removed all you will have in paradise in jannah in heaven is happiness and comfort god you will see in hellfire they will not even see God the one who made this universe everyone wants to know who is this who made everything always existed someone always existed with the beginning we have our own beginning but someone who has no beginning always existed who is this the people in hellfire will never be able to see God but the believer will see God their faces will be radiant on this day their faces will be radiant by seeing their God by seeing their Lord radiant they will be bright they will be they will come with so much contentment and happiness and bliss by seeing the Lord in fact there's nothing greater by seeing God the most beautiful thing that you can imagine God created beauty and he's a source of beauty and there's nothing more beautiful than God this is what is the highest reward that awaits a believer in heaven so this is what Islam teaches people it's not something like oh to believe in a Muslim to accept Islam you have to go in a pond or a lake at the coldest of winter and then immerse yourself 23 times every day not like that all you have to do in your heart you acknowledge La ilaha illallah. There is no God worthy of worship. Muhammad Rasulullah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. In your tongue you testify, you profess, declare that, show that commitment. Not only that I believe in my heart, but I am going to also profess it to make myself committed to it. Now I will be responsible. People have relationship. Man and women, man and man and women and women. Physical relationship, right? They live together. When there's no commitment, guess what happens? They have a fight, break up, and that's it. If they're married, what happens? Responsibility. The moment they're married, they show commitment and responsibility and duty because it's all in the contract. When you profess with your tongue, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, or Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, you've come into a contract with God that He is your Lord, your Creator, the one worthy of worship. So you will be dutiful to Him, show that duty. It's no longer just a lip service. You will profess yourself, live your life accordingly. And with your limbs, you will demonstrate that. It's not like I believe God is my God. So does Satan. Doesn't Satan know God is his God? But he doesn't comply with God's directions, directives, guidance, orders and prohibitions. So he's a disobedient individual. We don't want to be like that. We want to be obedient and submitting, surrendering to God. That is what a Muslim is. Someone who surrenders and submits to the will of God. So now, ask yourself, what is there for you to know and understand, to clarify, for you to accept and embrace this Islam which you know is true already in your heart? Ask. Well, sir, I'll have to think. Hmm? I'll have to think. No, no, 
ask, what is there? What is there stopping you from accepting Islam? Because do you know when I'm going to die, when you're going to die, when he's going to die? One of the conditions of going to paradise is to have making that declaration statement, affirmation. Like I have to say, yes, I acknowledge. Not only just faith that is brewing in your heart, or making that declaration. Can you guarantee you can die by saying it? You don't know when you're going to die. So why are we going to forfeit eternal Jannah, happiness, by being someone who is saying, I need to still do research. Have I finished reading about all about Islam? Have I learned everything that is this door about Islam? Have you? Have you? Have you? We are all learning every day, developing ourselves every day. There are scholars who have memorized not only the Quran, hundreds and thousands of the statements of the Prophet, they are still learning. They don't say, I've learned it all. So no one is on that state where saying, I know it all. But what they all have done here is by accepting it, we live our life as a Muslim, demonstrating that commitment to God, showing yes. And as we develop more and more, we come closer to God more and more. That is the internal struggle of ourselves called the jihad of the self. Yeah? Jihad is various types. People hear jihad, jihad, and they run. No, this is a struggle of your own soul against your own ego to better yourself from all of these vices of the heart, diseases of the heart. Look, anger, greed, jealousy, hatred. These are all diseases of the heart. No medicine can cure this. You can't go to a doctor. Can you prescribe me a medicine to, um, to control my jealousy? <laughs> disease of the heart is where you have to really make yourself know the solution. And the solution is the Quranic prescription. The prescription from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Do you want to add anything to my brother here? To, uh, Dara? No, no, please, because this brother, uh, Dara, he says there's nothing, there's nothing there in terms of, he says he's not yet not sure what to ask. So how can we help Dara to make that commitment and journey and saying, yes, now I'm ready. Is there anything stopping you to accept this <laughs> I mean, what, what would you like to know? To to Is it like your family saying, oh, yeah. Dara's become a Muslim? Kick out from the house. Yeah, Is yeah. that this? I mean, yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. It's, it's a lot to take, in. Eh? Yeah, yeah, but, but think about, so, what is there that didn't make sense? Then we can clarify a bit more. Exactly. So, when the truth comes to us, when our heart is already recipient of it, embrace it. Because that's not the end of the journey, Dara. It's the beginning. The beginning of worshipping God as we are supposed to worship. It took you so long, maybe 22 years or something. I don't know how old you are. Yeah? Yeah. Now is now a chance to say, now I'm going to put all my commitment to God worship God. Many Muslims are likewise, they have really been lost in not having that connection to their Creator. They need to come back. But we don't want to be a state where we die, we don't even know when we're going to die and that's it. We want to be sure that we die as a Muslim. This is one of the hopes that every Muslim have that make us die with the Muslim, make us die as Muslims by surrendering some meeting to you. That is where the salvation is guaranteed once you do that. But if you do not, then us, you know, you have to really struggle with your heart now. If you do not do so, as I said, the conditions you do not meet, and then we die without that commitment. How are you going to justify the day of judgment where you've been drugged to the punishment? You will say, um, what excuse can you give? No. But what are you losing now by becoming a Muslim? Let's talk about it. You're going to be a better individual because that's what the Prophet came to make you better. You're going to be more loving and caring to your parents, to your friends, your society. You'll be more responsible, more dutiful to your fellow human beings, to the environment. You will be now an individual who will explore and try to understand the world a bit more to contribute to the society. You will be someone with what everyone aims to be. What are you losing? Nothing. What are you gaining? Paradise. Is there any 
anything stopping you, like family or any external pressure? Uh, when, you, when you say that, I have to declare this and I have to tr like yeah. Yeah, fear all of you, sure, sure, in sure. my heart. Accepting in the heart? Yeah. And then comes declaration? Yeah. I have to, you know, I have to like fully convince myself that... What is not convincing to you so far? So that's what we can help. you said is not convincing. So you're convinced? Not, not, not convincing. Yeah, so, so you, this is a conviction already. When you say nothing, not con and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's already convincing. So your heart is convinced. Yeah. The heart is a Muslim. Dara, your heart is a Muslim. Lab dab, lab dab. It's saying, lab baik, lab baik. I'm here. The soul. Ask your soul. Ask you who you are. Ask. We leave it there. We leave it there. Thank you. But we hope and we pray that you don't stop there in your journey. That you continue, continue. When everyone's asleep, wake up three o'clock in the morning at your own home. Ask God, oh God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Guide me convincingly. And you will be guided. Okay? You take care, pleasure. And appreciate listening appreciate to you. It. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.